Hello, 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 everyone. Mike Arnold here, co-founder of Path Trading Partners, along with the one and only who is live today, Bob Iacchino. So if you want to hear what Bob up, says guys? you're new here, please do consider subscribing, ringing that bell, and hitting the like button. Longer-term subscribers, please like and leave some comments like you've been doing. So I'm going to bring Bob on very shortly, uh, real quick, because he's got a hard stop in about 25 minutes. So I want you guys to all have your questions ready, your questions ready. Uh, by the way, just to get it out of the way, tomorrow, a lot of the mortgage information comes out in the morning. Uh, we have Powell speaking again, pre-market. So keep an eye on that. Home sales comes out and then you have all the uh, gas stuff coming out at 9.30 in the central time and daily speaking also. So you have a fair amount of things that can also move the market. Heat map, a lot of green today and we'll talk about that after Bob's out. Uh, FOMC, 50 basis point hike odds, 64 uh, percent. By the way, we are in positive gamma territory now. So do keep that in mind and we'll review the that again tomorrow morning but 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 without further haste without further ado without further haste let me bring up they can't hear you yet bob <laughs> they can see you now you can hear me right i can hear you you're just faint i'm faint yes you are faint everything is up as loud as i've ever had it Boy, and you being quiet, that's not a normal thing. Hey, hey, Dan, Jet, hey, Wavy, Jake the Snake, hello. Morgan Stanley says the market down leg by the end of next month. And again, this is why we trail out, because we had another big update, another beautiful day in the corp. In the corp. Hello, Ted. Hello, Georges. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, Mike and Bob. Mike would like... Wanted a reminder to ask what Powell means about looking at the short end of the curve. Mm -hmm. Let's start with short that. end of the curve. So if, um, Mike, I don't know if you have that spreadsheet or if you have it somewhere else, the yield spreadsheet. But basically, I track every single day the different maturities. There's a couple that I leave out. But when the U.S. government issues a bond, they have a term that they expire within. So, for example, if they issued a bond today that was a two-year note, okay, that means that March 22nd of 2022, whoever bought that two-year note would get the amount they paid for it plus the listed interest rate, okay? So there's a two-year, a three-year, a five-year, a seven-year, a 10-year, a 20-year, and a 30-year. And then there's one month, three months, six months, 12 months, but let's not worry about that. The short end of the yield curve are the bond issues and note issues that mature the earliest. So generally, when someone's talking about the short end of the curve, they're talking about five year, three year, two year, 12 months, six month, three month, and one month maturities. In other words, they, they expire sooner. It's the short end of the yield curve. When you're talking about the long end of the yield curve, you're usually talking about seven-year notes, 10-year notes, 20-year bonds, and 30-year bonds. Does that make sense? It does to me. Good, good. So if they're focusing more on the short end of the curve to make policy decisions, what does that mean? Like so it means they're they're watching the performance of the yield on the short end of the curve. So the Federal Reserve only co controls, physically controls the very, very short end of the curve. So for example, they'll say that the Fed funds raised the Fed funds rate and the overnight rate. Okay. The Fed funds rate is the rate with which banks pay interest to the Fed, and the overnight rate is the rate within in the Fed pays interest to the banks, okay? And that is an overnight rate that is literally 24 hours. That's the duration of that particular interest payment. So that's the only one that the Fed directly controls. Now, when you talk about the short end that they affect, okay, when they raise, say, the overnight rate, 
Okay. Generally, banks will go out and raise the rate on the other things that they control, like the prime rate, for example, or they'll raise rates on your credit card because now when they pay the Fed, they have to pay them a higher interest rate and vice versa. They get a little bit higher interest rate, but it's always a, a little bit of a spread there. The Fed controls the short end of the curve because that's the most assets that they buy. So there's a second leg to this. In quantitative easing, the Fed has been buying assets, right? We all talk about the Fed's balance sheet being $7 trillion and $8 trillion. Most of those are concentrated in the short end. In other words, they don't own a lot of 20-year notes or 30-year bonds, but they do own a lot of two years and five years. So they now, which is not the way it was in the past, can actually physically control those by selling them or not buying them. I, I, this is, seems like it's getting a little in the weeds, but the Fed directly owns a lot of treasuries that have shorter durations or shorter expirations. So two year and five year. So they control those by what they do with those assets, just like anything else. If I own a bunch of Chevy Corvettes and I decide to sell them, the price of Chevy Corvettes will go down. If I own no Ford Mustangs, that price is not going to be affected by me selling Chevy Corvettes. Right. Does that make sense? Mm hmm. All right. Well, back to something. Wavy's blown away by the S&P up 6% since uh, Powell's presser started on Wednesday. <laughs> it's hard for Wavy not to be long this. We've talked about that. Yeah. Uh, also, I have a question. Michael Jones, did you have another? Uh, oh, OK. You did. That was the second part. Also, I had a question about science of cracks or weakness in the credit markets. Yeah. So. I asked that friend uh, that I told you I was going to ask, and he sent me this chart. Okay. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I can text it to Mike right now. We can put it text up on the screen. Text it to me and I'll put it up. All right. I'm going to text you this. And he basically sent me this and he said, what does this tell you? So this is mortgage, uh, mortgage-backed securities chart. I, just, I should have just sent it to you. And it's the yields on those mortgage-backed securities charts. Okay. Now this is going to take a little bit of an explanation. When the Fed was buying mortgage-backed securities, they were keeping those rates low. All right. So it's a real simple equation. When the price is going higher, the yield is going lower and vice versa. When the price is going lower, the yield is going higher. So when the Fed was buying mortgage-backed securities, that was keeping mortgage rates low. Okay. Did you get it, Mike? You've struggled no. with it. Did you text me? I did. Yeah, I thought I did. Or email me. I don't have. Hang on. Before I continue this, there's no point if the chart's not there. Yeah, I sent it to you. It says it's, I mean, I got your test. I I'll try not... and huh. the image is right above that word test. I'm going to send not it to online. you. <laughs> I wish I could click on it. You have it? No. I just sent it again. Oh, delivered yeah. quietly it says now it came through all right there we go all right so if you see the the sort of time period of this chart it goes all the way back to 2018 all right you see the peak up there at 4.8 percent like if you can point to that that's when the fed what's known as the taper tantrum Okay, and the taper tantrum was when the Fed said they're going to stop buying assets. And you could see that the mortgage-backed security rates were up around 4.8%. Then the Fed started buying mortgage-backed securities again. Look what happened to the rate. It just collapsed, right? Well, now the Fed is not buying those assets anymore, and it shot all the way back up to 4.5%. This is one of the indications of crack in credit markets because as rates go higher, in these types of assets, the Fed's not buying them. So people are demanding higher rates for those products, right? Because they don't believe in the economy. They don't believe inflation is going lower. So people who own these things have stress on their credit portfolios, okay? The stress is starting to build. The gaps are starting to widen between mortgage-backed securities and treasuries, the yield gap. That's the definition of stress in the credit markets. So what this means is that banks and mortgage companies are going to start requiring much, much higher 
credit scores and much, much higher background checks and things to loan out so that they can pay a higher interest rate on these things, or I should say charge a higher interest rate and then sell them for a better price to the people who want to buy them. The credit quality has to be higher in order for banks to be able to sell these to people. Whereas the Fed didn't give a shit about what the credit quality was. They were buying everything. That's the stress in the credit market that is starting to show up. So it's showing up in mortgage backed securities mostly, and it's showing up in lower grade credit rates versus higher grade credit rates on the corporate side as well. Does that make sense? That answer your question, I guess. What well, made sense to me. Now, if I could get that to disappear, then it would. Michael, let me, Michael Jones, let me know if that makes sense. If not, I'll work on a simpler explanation for it um, for Thursday. And we'll continue to watch it. I sound like one of those TV shows. Boy, I can't. You watch those guys on Bloomberg and everything, and they're like, well, the Fed said they're going to be more aggressive. So now the question becomes how aggressive. Gee, thanks for that. Thanks for telling me what the question becomes. Uh, let's see. Bob, any thoughts on student loans? Continue chatter about more payment, pause extensions, pressure for forgiveness, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, that's a political question, Jake, but it would not be good for the overall economy. People think that the student loan forgiveness is going to unleash a spending spree by the students who owe the student loans. First of all, the student loan thing is you talk about price gouging by oil companies, right, and price gouging by greedy corporations. They should really be working on the price gouging by universities whose actual product has dropped in value over the last 20, 30 years while their prices have gone through the roof, simply because the payment of those prices has been funded by cheap government loans. The student loan situation is a perfect example of what cheap financing gets you, right? Cheap, regardless of credit, financing gets you overpriced assets that aren't worth what they're being paid for. And that's what the university of education is now. Okay, people can't get by with a bachelor's degree. They can't get by with a master's even anymore. And the cost of those things are through the roof. I saw uh, Elizabeth Warren tweet that she paid $500 for her state education. And she goes, so we got to forgive the student loans. With no mention of how a state education is now like $32,000 a year. Right? Anyway. Um, but the forgiveness of those will cause a little bit of a cascade effect most of them are owned by government but again we tend to think that if there's a default to the government it doesn't come back to us in some way shape or form so i don't love the idea of student loan forgiveness but honestly i don't have a solution for it i really think it should be forgiven at the university level like i think that the government should be going back to the universities and rating their their um, endowments to pay these things back when students can't pay so in other words, if you give a student a student loan and he legitimately can't pay, it shouldn't be forgiven and just forgotten. It should be clawed back from university endowments because that would stop the universities from issuing these loans and they would actually just reduce tuition when they actually wanted someone to get in. All right. Oh, by the way, back to your, your thing, because I was seeing... Uh, about three weeks ago, before this chart exploded, you know, and the Fed was still buying yeah. stuff, that yeah. people were allowing, or, or certain uh, mortgage companies were allowing people to send in s photographs of their bank statements. <laughs> <laughs> the Isn't that what Bernie Madoff did? What? Isn't that what Bernie Madoff yeah. did? And so, it, I mean, it was shades of the last housing bubble where you could, just, hey, just send us a photo, a photograph of your bank statement, which could be so fudged. It's beyond. But Bernie Madoff, till the very end, was sending out statements that he made in his office on a copy machine. Yeah, exactly. But this is now that's not good with the Fed not buying the MBS is that's going to drastically change stuff. And that relates back to cracks in the financial system. Hi, Tim and Terry. Welcome, welcome. The Sterling, welcome. Davey says, Bob, can you discuss a stock being investment grade? What will this mean to the stock when they transition from non-investment grade to investment grade? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, usually investment grade refers to a bond. 
Um, I think investment grade on a stock, and Mike, you can chime in here if you want, but investment investment grade on a stock to me is kind of an opinion. Um, like Mike and I have our own sort of litmus test for what we'll put like in our in the stock think tank in our core portfolio. We consider those to be investment grade. Um, some people might say that Tesla is investment grade, but when you're talking about a corporate issuance, we don't think it, but some people might think it. We, when you, but when you're talking about a corporate bond, they actually get a rating from S and P's, from Moody's. Um, I don't remember the third one. There's three major ones. Who's the third one, Mike? Do you remember? Moody's S and P. I, I, yeah. I don't. I don't remember. Um, those rating agencies will give those will give ratings, and anything under triple B is considered non-investment grade and anything under C is considered junk. So the rating is derived from profitability, cash on hand, the ability to pay back their debt, basically. So when something transitions from junk to investment grade or from uh, non-investment grade to investment grade, they're able to borrow in the market at a much lower interest rate. So when a company issues a corporate bond, the market essentially decides they can put it up at whatever coupon they want. And then the market decides what the actual coupon is by whether they buy it at that price or not. So that process is actually pretty simple. I say, I'm going to sell a bond for a hundred dollars. Okay. And I'm going to pay 10% interest on, it, right? Well, that would clearly be well below investment grade, right? Cause a 10% return on a corporate bond is basically a junk bond, right? So let's say I, I issue that. Now somebody says to me, well, your bonds are now triple B rated. Okay, the highest being triple A plus. They say your bonds are now triple B plus. I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna sell another one for $100 and I'm gonna pay you $102 at the end of the term. That's more of an investment grade return because you have a higher probability of getting all your money plus your interest back. So I've now borrowed at 2% versus when my company was junk, I borrowed at 10%. Does that make sense? So it's a credit score thing and it more applies to the bonds than it does to the stock. We've seen plenty of companies that in the bond market would be what's below junk. They'd be shit, but they're still able to sell their stock. Like maybe a lucid, for example, they're still able to sell their stock, but their bonds, you know, you can't get a, a low yield corporate bond out of them to save their life. You know, and if you want a broad definition, yeah, you're right. With I don't know of a distinct rating, but a lot of OTC stuff, I would not consider investment grade. If it can't even get listed on an exchange, and even some stuff listed on an exchange shouldn't be investment grade, by the way. Right. <laughs> but, but like when you refer to it was trading on the pink sheets, you know, it yeah. was that's <laughs> when it's trading for one or two cents on the pink sheets, you don't want to consider that investment grade. That's purely speculative. Uh, let's see. Let's see where we sit. So that thanks for that question, Davey. Sterling Mitch. is calling for a triple point correction in the ES before the end of the trading week. All right. I, I'm with you. Fitch is the other creating, rating agency. Thank Mike. you. Market is pricing everything, even the end of the world. And by the way, it's spring. Everything is green. <laughs> so market has priced in everything. And did you see we're back to that just real quick? When you got GameStop doing this today, now we had a double bottom, but this GameStop, GameStop. I went into I went into a GameStop AMC Twitter space today to listen to the conversation. Oh my God, they're out of their minds. Oh yeah, it's crazy. they're out of their minds. It's crazy. And they're We're literally back. like saying stuff like, "We're ripping, boys." This reminds me of last time. We're ripping. Oh, the shorts are starting to cover. It's 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 we're back to. I told you we never got out of the buy the dip, buy the crap, buy the everything. Now, also, when I said one last actually, week to focus on buy the mega caps, here's my mega my custom mega cap index. <laughs> Look at that. I one told guy you. actually said that uh, he could see his boathouse now because AMC and. GameStop, we're ripping. <laughs> See, we're back to the crazy. We're back to crazy. We're back to crazy. Uh, Wavy yep. paid 50K for a degree, but it could only get me a job for 60K a year. 
<laughs> is that a good return Check on the interest in your negative that's what i call <laughs> negative real return yep uh let's see the uh, this market is not lining up with the bond market and i don't like that because the bond market is suggesting the federal reserve is going to raise interest rates multiple times so if i could touch on that the curves actually steepening so it actually is lining up with the bond market. Um, the one thing you could say to, to Rich's point where Rich is absolutely correct is you could say that TINA is dead. Do you guys know what TINA is? Mike does. TINA stands for there is no alternative to stocks. Okay. And that was basically because yields were so low. But right now the S&P yield, okay, dividend yield is about 1.63%. And the two-year note is, well, what's a two-year note as of now? I just literally just looked at it, 2.18. So it's almost a full percentage point higher. It's about a half a percentage point higher than the dividend yield on the, on the S&P 500. So in that point, Rich, you're dead on perfectly correct. But what I think is happening right now is the yield curve steepening. So that's taking certain investors into this idea that, okay, the curve is steepening again. So now we're not going to have a recession, but I still think we are. I think the yield, I think the Fed, Jerome Powell convinced me, and again, agreeing with Rich Beast here, Jerome Powell convinced me that he's willing to be aggressive. So the possibility of 50 and 50 is definitely on the table if Powell says it's possible. It doesn't matter that Bullard says we need it, and that he dissented, and that uh, Barkin said he thought it was a good idea. Raphael Bostic said not so much, but... Powell said, yeah, we could definitely be more aggressive. I think he was communicating that inflation is his only concern right now. And I think he's right to say that. He's a year too late, but he's right to say that. So, Rich, I agree with you. The only thing I would say is that the yield curve is steepening. So stocks going up in a steepening yield curve actually takes away the example I showed you guys last week where, in other words, the market thinks the Fed's hikes are going to work. That's what this theoretical rally could, could be a part of. Remember I said that the, we go up to the to the death cross before we fall and we're through it. We're beyond the death cross. We're yeah, we're through it. So and that's happened a lot. William, well, I'll take a look at some commodity stuff after we let Bob go because he's only got a few minutes. Uh, typically blinds has a stock market, but people are starting to bet that they won't tell you what if somebody at the Fed comes out and states unequivocally that they're going to uh, we could see a massive res reversal. I've missed one in there. Maybe I've missed a comment in there. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, there's a t t Gary Black was discussing Tesla becoming investment grade after the upcoming earnings. So that would be on their bonds being rated because up to now they haven't been investment grade. So the stock, you're not applying that to the stock. You're applying that to, uh, Tesla great investment grade bonds, which, you know, that just changes the rating on Tesla. Yep. So uh, let's see. And investment grade relates to credit score of AAA to BAA3. Exactly. So, boy, anything else you want to talk about, Bob? Anything, any thoughts on, all right, do you have any thoughts on crude? Before you leave or anything else? Yeah, I do. Um, crude oil, we're, we're entering the the gas prices. California is now above $6 a gallon, even for regular. Um, the national average, I believe, actually, I just had it. I think it's 454. It's better that I show it, that I look at it rather than I just make it up. Uh, I think it's on this one. But that's why I don't allow you on CNBC anymore, because you actually want to look at something instead of just making it up. Yeah, I don't want to just make it up and be on CNBC should be called TMZ Financial. According to AAA, the current national national gas average is 424 for regular 491 for premium. And Los Angeles is above six dollars a barrel for both. So a study I read a while back as we were crawling above ninety five dollars a barrel said that above four dollars on the national average is when behavior starts to change so we're well above that um if 
that's true, if the study is true, then you could start looking for some demand destruction. But in addition to that, Cushing inventories, for those of you that don't know, uh, the, the excess inventories are held in Cushing, Oklahoma, uh, for crude oil here in the U.S., are starting to approach record lows. They've depleted by about 13 million barrels over the last few weeks. And that's going to call for another release from the SPR. If it doesn't, that's likely to be the driver for the next spike because we are going to get a summer driving season demand spike simply because of the city's kind of reopening from the mask mandates and the shit like that. So um, I think crude oil is kind of poised for another spike here. Um, and it actually is behaving technically in a way that we kind of like where it breaks out, we get a cross, it moves up, eight pushing the price, comes down into the rotation zone and then holds, right? I would have liked to see it come a little bit further down, but um, so I'm expecting us to pop back up in crude oil. Uh, although again, I don't, I don't have a trade for this. So here, here's the, here's the final comment. We'll let you go back, Bob. Funny comment. I heard this week the only place you can get <laughs> now your gas under four dollars is Taco Bell. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard that line a couple of times. So there we go. Anything else you want to say before you pop off, Bob? No, that's about it. I will talk to you guys on Thursday. If anything big comes out in the morning, uh, Mike just text me and I'll try and jump on the morning one. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Thursday. All right, perfect. Thank you for being here. And we will talk. All right, cheers, guys. All right. Let me disappear. Me and reappear small mic so you don't have to look at my big head, my big shiny head. So there we go. We had Bob on. Uh, let me know if what we want to look at now i'm going to switch cameras if it'll let me there we go all right so let's take a look at the markets again we talked to this morning by the way if you're just watching the afternoon uh show i'll call it the afternoon show you're missing some out on the market preview the market open show where we update some levels because look at this i mean i'm not trying to hit stuff to the high with the harmonics by any means, I just had to move that out of the way. 45, 14, 75. I, I was surprised we got there today, but uh, that pretty much, and again, that was just sheer luck. The harmonics aren't designed to hit the exact highs or lows, but 45, 14, 75. Why I also leave on the other harmonics is because, let me show you the shorter term chart before I update them. You know, because here, a lot of times when you, you paused here, then we blasted through and you see how it became support. The prior harmonic became support. So you can definitely use that. And we know how, after in, you know, I start shifting that 15 minute chart, rotation, rotation, and finally that spike up with some of the waning momentum. So could we still get a correction? Yeah, we could. Just no major topping pattern yet. Uh what am I watching for overnight? Again, I'm watching for a pullback to this little breakout area and the 12.5% retracement. So, and the rising four hour rotation zone. If we did drop below that, if we got an overnight correction, I'd be watching the bottom of this congestion, 44.27 area to about 44.32 with the bottom of the four hour rotation zone. So, those are the two things I'm watching for overnight. On a continued rally, we already have our next major area, 62.5% key from this whole sell-off, 45.43 area, then 45.57. That's what we are looking at. That's what I am watching overnight. NASDAQ, again, look, here we go. I stopped this just a hair. But we had the intraday price action. See here coming up, and again, this one didn't hit it exactly, but it gave you a great area to uh, move up stops or take some profits off the table at 14,654. Again, this is more like what I like to see because you just get through it, reaction, 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 and just flatlining at the end of the day at that level. So level holding really nicely right there. Uh, let's see what else. We'll get to some other stuff uh, with some stocks. I'll take a look at these. Let me just get through this again. Overnight, what am I watching here? 
pull back to the prior breakout zone, 12.5% retracement, same same playbook with the NASDAQ. That's coming in about 14,468. If we did drop below there, bottom of the support with the rotation zone about 14,270, which would also be the 25. So we got harmonics, we got rotation zones, and we got just pure price action lining up for key levels there. Higher push again, this would take us to 50% for this whole sell-off. 14,855 is the next target. And this is why I got to stress, if you learn one thing, don't trade what you think, trail out of your little final position. So if you've been holding long with the rally, yeah, you keep raising your stops. And you keep trying to capture, you're not trying to pick a top tick, but you're trying to capture as much of it as your trading strategies allow you to. We don't buy the exact bottom, sell the exact top. By the way, I threw there, I just target these prior highs with the 200 dow which uh stalling out the dow only up uh 80 basis points today stalling out not much going on in the dow the big action was with the s p and nasdaq i did leave on these targets just to watch for pullbacks to that top target area which was also the support level but you see dow just caught in a range so where do we sit with the dow same targets as earlier today Minor would be 34,890, then 35,14, then 35,331. Uh, what I'm watching overnight, Dow's already dipped in a four hour rotation zone. So, really, I'm keying off of about this, this area right in here now, about 34,336. And we do have some divergences continually forming on the Dow. Major support, if it does break down more for the Dow, is about 33,950. Uh, Russell still stalling out against this key area, trying to break through there, but not making much progress. I'll get to the questions in a second. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Bob, the other day, mentioned 80% probability of retracement back to the Doji candle, which for the NASDAQ mini is roughly 15,122. 15,122. Oh, this up. 15,122. It's right where the uh, 200 is. Uh, also interesting, 200 DMA. It looks like we're heading there. It, it does completely. And again, we could get a pullback and then another push higher. What I said earlier this week, or did I, yeah, I said it, did I say it Sunday or Monday? I don't remember. But this is the shades of what happened after the first initial sell off in 2000. And then everybody piling back in like it's hunky-dory, la-la land. And everybody's, you know, a bunch of people sitting there that I used to talk to. What's going on? This can't keep rallying back. It's worse off than it was. And it just kept going. So, yeah, that's the next major target area. Uh, almost like blind faith based on Bob's comments. My QQQ calls have been skyrocketing every, every day. Yeah. That's why, again, we might get a pullback. I don't have a major topping pattern besides divergences yet. We don't have a major topping pattern, so we could definitely pull back. But I'm, I'm, I, I know where my key levels are. But if it does continue higher, it does continue higher. There's nothing else I can say about it, you know. And I would not be surprised to see the Nasdaq in between this 50% and the 200% before we get a topping pattern. If you have a gap up and the price keeps going like the ES today, do you track the harmonic retracements from the previous day's close or from where it opened? Oh, uh, gap up. Well, the ES really, a gap up like today. I'm trying to think about what you mean. Are you talking about more like the spiders? Because we didn't really have a gap. We There's no gap in the futures. I'd have to... For the gap fill, it's always the prior day's close. From everything else with harmonics, it's from the key lows to the pausing bar highs. Okay? So there was a gap up in the spiders. That's why I was asking. Now, the first thing, again, you're gonna you're not gonna do anything. Thank you. That's what I thought you meant, but uh, he, he certainly meant the spy, yeah. You're not going to do anything from the prior day's close with the harmonics. That's for only for harmonic retracements. Okay. So if you were doing the spies, you know, the longest move was here. 
for your harmonics. That was the start of this move, okay? And you, if you want to argue this was the start of the move, fine. You know what? I'm not going to get nitpicky because it's virtually the same target, and that's why we're not trying to call the last. But I like to do the move that really started it. This was the major pausing bar back to the rotation zone. You see there, pausing bar one in four hours. It was just a doji on the daily. So that's your major harmonic. Then the minor, what I was watching, if you're doing the spies, I was watching the little reverse harmonics first and foremost, which gave me the minor targets. So you see, blowing through, you can look at this, but you know, little pause at that first target, then going through with momentum bars, coming back to the second harmonic, and then moving up. So that's exactly how you do it. Now, what can you watch for again for tomorrow if you're watching for the spies? So from the prior day's close, you keep ratcheting this up. So I will start targeting a gap fill just short term. You know, if we start getting that close below that uh, 62 and a half, that's how you use the gap fill harmonics to that. That's when I will start targeting more of a breakdown, keeping in mind that it's a very tight play and it's going into key support. Okay. So that's how now with this pausing bar, let me go back. We'll do a little lesson here, little harmonics lesson. Now, based off the most recent swing, we don't have much of a pause here, but there's your minor levels for tomorrow morning. I prefer a little bigger pause here because we don't, you could drop it to here, but I will watch the over, you know, to see what's happening, but that pretty much reinforces this high area. So then 451.94, then I'd have to be going after 454.13. And that's your forward harmonic. I saw we had something on MO. I still want to call it Philip Morris. <laughs> Altira. That's how long I've been around for. Again, I, I'm still bullish on this on a pullback in the market. So I will watch for a, a gap fill play in here. Again, you have two tops with this. I'm would not trade this as a double now you stick and there's no potential head and shoulders with this gap up there was before it was a horribly sloppy thing that i was just going to use the targets for if we downside but i'm still bullish on the stock even with the pullback what would change that is if we drop back below about 50 50. but i am watching if we do start to break down here's another example of your little gap fill play because you could use this for a watch for a pull, a buyable pullback. Here's the exact example. And look at that. It's the spike up or turn that 62 and a half rotation back up. You get start getting a close blow here then. You got the gap fill play to go for. And if you don't short or don't want to short, you go, that's where you look because the gap fill play takes you back into that four hour rotation zone. And if you're bullish, you can start watching for another play up. So what, uh, let's see. I wanted to look, we had a William, I mean, who was William? Was that we William? Can we look at commodities, please? Again, commodities. Let me just run through some of these other markets. Cause we can also do another stock update in on the second one. Uh, Gold still just sitting here sideways congestion with slight downward pressure. Nothing going on there. Silver, again, we're tracing to the head and shoulders. The head and shoulders is still completely valid. So if we start breaking back down below the low from 16th of March, which is a gift in my book, 2431 and 2382 are my next lower targets. Nothing's changed there. Commodity index, here's the S&P Goldman. Again, trying to, you see here, let me update this, but you see here coming back down to those harmonics, bouncing back up. The only way I get super bullish on the short term is above on a close. I watched a bunch of different commodity indices, but I'd have to get, this would have to be a close above 788. Otherwise, I'm watching for a little longer rollover play. I'm still watching for some rollover plays here. 
And then uh, you get this because uh, there's, there's a lot of people still trapped up here with commodity plays. And I think we could get a flush out move. I think we could still get a flush out move, move in crude. And I agree that we're going to have more pressure on crude longer term. But I think we could get a short term flush out move. Uh, what else do we want to? Let's just take a look at DB. Ag index is pausing here. With this sloppy double still not stopped out. So I'm seeing still if that will roll over again. Nothing short here, but I'm watching for key pullback levels. And DBC. DBC, again, still you can do your minor. This is from C, still not a close above that 62 and a half. So I'm keeping an eye on that. Let's see. And now I can get to some more stocks. Uh, Rich S&P 500 close to the weekly rotation zone. On, uh, on the futures, it's well above there. So that's in neutral mode on the cash. What happened to, I thought I typed SPX, I was not Apex. Uh, it's technically above it on, if and I use the 21 EMA. So this is also in neutral mode. This is just fascinating markets. I mean, even on pullbacks, you got the cross of the uh, rotation zone. So even on pullbacks are still short term viable unless we really break down. Let's see what else, end phase. End phase has triggered uh, this larger double pattern. So now your next targets are still the same. 218, 03, 235, 46. What would invalidate it? You'd need to move back down, you know, into this area to invalidate that whole double pattern. So even on pullbacks, it's, it's still viable on a short term. I just watched that short term daily rotation zone. Again, not investment advice. Yeah, I don't use the simple, Rich. It didn't test out as well. Uh, so USO, US oil. I I just do not like tr trading that. Do not like it as much. But if you can't trade the futures, uh, you don't have the purest price action in it. You're better to do your analysis on... Uh, on the futures, but it's caught between the 50 and the 62 and a half. So, I mean, I'd be, again, if it breaks down below the 7730 area, I'd be watching for that gap fill, but I'm just keying off the overall crude futures. That's why I watch those. And uh, by the way, I updated if you wonder why the we have a new defining point right here. So this was the old defining point. If you want to know uh, what I'm talking about with initiating defining points, watch the videos. It's I think it's titled Trend Lines for Cryptos, but it, it's the same for every market. I recorded that when everybody wanted stuff for crypto markets. Why did I update it? Because this is the new defining point, and that's a key support area, and we have the 21. So I'm watching with this 21 flattening out. Still, we're chipping away at the trend line, but we're not really breaking it yet, and I'm focusing on this 21 EMA right there for a potential pullback move. So that's where I sit with that. How long does it take to complete a double in the... It's... Oh boy. See, that's the tricky thing. I could not find a, a rule of thumb that, that was usable. Generally, dailies complete within a month, generally. But I've seen, see, I've seen dailies complete in, a, in a, I've seen them even complete in a day off a daily chart. But generally, it's if there's strong momentum, it can be within a week. It just depends on how big the double is. That's the key. You can have a small daily double or a big daily double. You can have weeklies that take, six months to a year to complete that's where it gets challenging with options 
because options have the timing component. So if you're trading options, you have to trade sort of using some shorter term price action in the longer term direction. If you're just trading the stock, you can trade around the core position if you're trading a bigger double, but there's no specific rule of thumb for exact timing. It all depends on, again, how strong the momentum is. Strong momentum markets in a strong momentum sector, they can complete, you know, in a week. Slow momentum, like you get a double on utilities, they could take two, two, two months to complete. Yeah, Tesla, we're back in this, we're back in the rah-rah markets, and I expect some bad news to drop on Tesla, but there was that, I, I'm surprised we hit that 989. So we shall see with Tesla, this is why I just keep trailing. Just keep trailing with Tesla. Here's our up, we got a little pausing area up here. I'm just doing the longer term stuff, not even a huge pause up here. Getting way overextended. This reminds me of before. So let's see. My back to my key supports now coming back in it all the way back to 941. But here's your next levels higher. 1017 to 1028 and 1058. Again, you just got to trail out. If you want a warning sign, a warning sign is... For tomorrow morning, I'll be I'd be watching the 15 minute rotation zone because you got a lot of clear path moves in here. Let's see, Jake. I'm in that exact situation for a couple daily doubles with options right now. That's where it does get challenging. That's why if I'm trading options with double patterns, I have to I manage the position really close. And you got to be careful going too way too short term duration, like trying to trade a daily double with weekly options. You have to really then time partial moves based off what like the one hour and four hour patterns are doing. That's my advice. If you're trying to trade stuff with really short term options like weeklies, you got to you got to key off those one and four hour rotation zones and time the trades really, really well and use the the uh, harmonics. Separate from the double targets, use the harmonics to help you learn, all right, look, we've hit a harmonic. We're pausing there. We're getting some divergences. Let me consider uh, taking some of my position off because we get that pullback. I can reinitiate a new options position. We're completely back to casino mode. Again, what I showed before, this, this. We're casino mode on steroids. You're telling me, GameStop, again, this was all just another mass-driven Reddit trying to do some short squeeze. Uh, you're telling me GameStop increased by in value today 30, almost 31%. What's funny is it is this is going to set up for great shorts again. But uh, I'm reading the boards, you know, some stuff because people send me stuff who really monitor this and people are like, ah, we're going back above 300 in a, in a week. Uh -huh. We're back to full blown casino mode. And by the way, remember, we have one of the reasons I track this, this, uh, Keith, th these kind of things like my mega cap. I said, get into mega caps. Look at my, the ratios. Because you, these mega caps drive the indices. So if you really want to push the indices higher, you concentrate stuff in the mega caps. Here's our mega cap. Remember the mega cap ratio? I had this up. What do we have here? Double bottom. Look at this. There you go. Don't know what else to say. It works on ratios. It works on stuff. Right back. Does it have to stop here? No, but I get a little... This is where I'd start watching for a potential mega cap rollover. Now we're completely juicing the junk growth. Value versus growth. There we go. Can it squeeze a little higher in growth? Sure can. Even with a pullback, it can squeeze a little higher in growth. But double bottom, that qualified. There's your targets. All right. Let's see.
If there's a double on daily, we can enter a trade on five minute using harmonics. If there's a double on a daily, you can trade on a shorter term basis. Yeah. And that's where I'll use stuff. I'll use the shorter term patterns to help fine tune the trades. But you could be, let's say you didn't want to trade a, uh, a larger double bottom. I'm trying to think of one. What, what's one somebody's in now? Throw out a double bottom. Give me a double bottom and I'll, I'll talk about that. Let me just see what other questions there are. I'll always buy two, three months on options more than I think I need. More expensive up front, but not necessarily more expensive as time drags on. I completely agree. Or a double on a one hour and a trade on a five minute. You can completely do that. Let's see. BP, thank you, Sterling. I was just, you know, when I'm doing these live streams, sometimes I, I blank out with stuff like I couldn't remember Fitch the third rating agency I got a lot going on in my head surely live streaming isn't as easy as as it looks as Bob makes it look uh, so for example let's say this triggers BP let's say BP triggers above this and this is how you can trade it shorter term Above this 3027, you start getting intraday momentum above there. I especially like a break if on a five minute chart or a 15 minute chart, a break and a retest. So we're going to break above there. I wonder if I can draw some lines here. So what I, let's see, a break. A little teaching mode. Maybe I'll just do one again today. So if you want to stick around, if for any more stocks, if there any more else, we'll just do one session today. I'm feeling a little tired. So an intraday break, and this would be on a shorter term chart, a retest, and then I'm then I'm targeting, you know, the move, the move back up. Okay. And how do you do that? Then you could do something like this. And again, this is going to be a rough estimate because I can't, this is, this would be a pausing area, but then what would I do? This is how you use the harmonics within this. You see this? So if I was trading this intraday, we got something, I like to always wait for a break and a retest because a lot of times you'll get the break. And if it just falls back through that level, like just like a, like a brick on a foot, you don't, I don't want to touch it. Because it, it, sometimes there's those fake out moves. That's why I tell people with why, why we teach to newer people to wait for the close. Because yes, you're going to miss some, but you're also going to get in the higher probability ones. But if you want to trade it shorter, see how I did this? Now pretend this is within this daily context. Pretend this is a five minute chart, these little black lines. So break, retest. I can now update a key harmonic. And now these are levels I'm going to key off intraday. All right, so let's say, let's say we got something then like, oops, hold on one second. I wanted to do this. Let's say that intraday, let's say it stalls out there. All right, so I'm moving up a stop. I'm moving up a stop because we didn't even hit the first target level. Now, what am I going to do? Let's say the next day we get a pullback. Well, what does that enable me to do? Raise this. Uh, this is where I'm going to watch those rotation zones. We get into an intraday rotation zone. What I'm going to watch for rotation back up. And now I got my targets to go. So I can, again, raise stops, you know, here. And if I don't want to hold overnight, I can take stuff off as they hit, you know, raise stop, take stuff off intraday. Then I'm going to use this as a target. And I'm going to keep unfolding using those rotation zone concepts, key support resistance points, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to trade around this BP double. All right. I guess my, my word of the day is now all right. <laughs> Sorry when I get repeat stuff like that. Let's see. Let me know if that makes sense. ADP UPS. I doubt you want the pair trade. <laughs> That's how we used to do, if we were going to do pair trades, uh, it would be like XOM slash CV, CVX. Like I'm doing a pair trade on uh, Exxon Mobil uh, Chevron. ADP, nothing's changed here. 
So that was a good double also. So again, if you're trading this around intraday, again, today, let's just say I, I only want to trade ADP, this longer term double today. So I can give an example. Great little thing. Today, you start breaking above, like especially you, you got the gap up. You watch for that rotation, retracement. All right, where were we? Gap up. 15 minute rotation zone, starting a rotation back up. And you can use for intraday price action. Rotation back up, all right. I'm gonna target here. Well, it's getting to the end of day. Here you go, end of day, end of day. All right, I'm taking, I don't wanna carry overnight. My 215, it gave me multiple chances to get out right around that area. Because this, at the based off the end of day was was too far now for the next day we can watch let's say we have some weakness tomorrow well here's prior support rotation zone so morning weakness watch for that and a rotation back up and then you can use the most recent so you get even on a pullback now if you get a break above the highs then you're going to have to go with the breakout play and that would be raise stop you know, it, depending on how early these are hit, they could be raise, stop, raise, stop, and then do a new projection. Or if it's, you know, pulls back and then you're getting that rotation up and you jump on it with this prior resistance becoming support with the rising rotation zone. And then you're going to be, you know, it could be, hey, we're back above this highs in the morning, raise, stop, and that's my target for the end of today, end of day. And then you're going to fine tune it with the afternoon price action. So that's a great little thing. Thank you again for that ADP. There's an example of how you can trade around the core position. Where would I get cautious if it started dropping back below the two uh, or back below the rotation zone on the daily? Then I'd start watching for a potential bigger pullback. And then I would need it to get it wouldn't stop out that double, but I would need it to get back up into this key price action here to start playing it intraday again. And again, UPS. Now UPS breaking out multi-day pause. So this is flat. So again, if you're trading around a double, this is just another example. What would I be start watching for? If it starts breaking down below this level, not touching it. If we start breaking out because we're in flat consolidation, horizontal consolidation, you start breaking out about 22015 with that same thing. Breakout, retest, and then move back up. Super aggressive is just trying to buy a, a breakout. Okay? Here's an example. Breakout, retest, eh. Breakout. I'm watching for the retest. Eh. Those are examples you don't want. You want to break out, and yeah, I can dip it below, but this was a, this was weak sauce, and that was the end of the day too. This is a better example. So even this, if I fine tune these levels, but break out, pull back, re, you see this little retest pause, and then it starts moving back up. That's a better example to trade around a core position intraday, or trade around a larger pattern intraday. So thanks again. Uh, Jake, thanks for put, uh, putting those in there. Thanks, Sterling. So, uh, let's see. Oh, thank you very much, Genomic Stock. Thank you for the super chat. Again, thank you for supporting this channel and supporting my time and the stuff I teach. Just trying to help you out with some techniques that you can possibly utilize in your own trading regimen. And you don't have to trade that on the five minute. You can trade 15 minute. You can trade one hour. It's timing your strategies. But a lot of this, these concepts work across all these different time frames. Rich, gold consolidating next move 2050. The next move up. Well, the first target, once it, it unless we make break below these lows from the 16th, in which case these targets will trade, but on a move up, I'm watching this trend line right here. Oops. I'm watching this trend line right here. We start getting back above there. 
and intraday, you know, starting getting back above about 1946, 1948 area right in here. Then I'm watching for a push. This would be an area I'd be looking to raise stops. This is my first target is about 1991. My next target is 2013. And then if we really get through there on a closing basis, then I'm watching for a retest of the 26, 2059, 2060 to 2082 areas. That's how, that's my overall strategy for that. Now, if we pull back, you're going to have to ask me for a reassessment. All right. I'm not seeing anything else. Let me know if you like that little teaching method. Let me know if you want more or less of that. I think genomic stock liked it. Uh, let's see. If you're in an options play that stock is paying a dividend in a couple days, would you sell the calls the day before the payment and get back in after the payment? Yeah. Uh, generally, yes, you can easily do that, especially on a bigger dividend. Not unlike a small little dividend. Okay, consider that on a bigger dividend. For example, let, hold on, let me see something here. Let me see something. Uh, I'm just, oh boy, why can't I remember it? There was a great little, where was it? The one we were looking at the other day, it was that shipping company with the $16 dividend. Somebody remind me, ZIM. This is an example of a big dividend. Because what happens with your dividend when it pays out, or this is, sorry, 17 bucks, it's going to drop that payout amount. Now, there can be pressure to resume the trend, but look at that, right to act at 16 and a half, 62 and a half percent and the prior support. So you're roughly going to know the payout amount is going to drop the stock. So yes, now I'm not saying this was the play. I'm just citing this as an example because I knew there was that big gap down due to a dividend. This is not changing anything fundamentally with the stock. This was changing because of the dividend payout. Okay. I just like how it came back down into the key area right here. This stuff works uncanny period. Uh, so now it's watching for a backup, which gives a, there's some great gap plays in this now. That's what I'm going to do. That's why I had it up earlier. I was going to actually talk about this with this dividend gap down. And yes, you can. You can sell calls. You could get out of your bullish position. Let's say you're a bullish. Let's per, pretend you could play this with the options. You're bullish playing this with options. Just as an example, look, I know there's a big dividend payout. I'm getting out of my calls or I, I want to do something else. I'm shorting some calls. Uh, and then or I'm putting on a bear call spread and then you're it's a little trickier because it's already going to get priced in with the options more so because everybody knows the dividend payout is going to be so it's reflected somewhat in the premium and everything else so you're not going to get the best play but if you're long something and you want to lock something in and then reestablish it after the the uh, dividend payout that is a completely valid strategy to utilize especially with a bigger dividend. If it was like a very small dividend, wouldn't even bother. You're getting too cute. And don't get too cute. All right. There we go. You are welcome, Wavy. I hope you did learn something. Again, thank you for typing that in, Eric. I'm just going to do this one live stream. I don't. I hope nobody has a problem with that. But, oh, I just wanted to take a look. Look at, uh, just wanted to take a look again with Exxon pausing here, still watching for some stuff. Still, again, I'm still watching for the longer term play if oil does break down, but nothing really doing inside bar here. I just wanted to glance at that, did not take a look at it going into the close. Thank you very much, Sterling. Thank you for the super chat. Again, all this stuff. It makes it part of doing this every day. You know, it helps. And so I really appreciate it. It helps to keep the channel going and to offset the software and streaming costs and everything else we do. 
We are closer to all-time highs and at the yearly lows at this point. Agreed. And just for the people who didn't see the Sunday session, why I keep saying it reminds me of 2000. We're getting close. No, I mean, on my Wayback Machine. Where is it? Here, we're ramping up here. Uh, here we go. Big sell-off, sell-off retest, and then just grinding higher, and look how much it got within those highs. Look how much it got within those highs, especially once it closed above the 62.5 retracement, and then it rolled over. However, the whole time, the NASDAQ remains slightly weaker. If you go back on the Wayback Machine on NASDAQ, NASDAQ, you see here big sell-off, breaking the new lows, bouncing back, bouncing back again. Just to recap in case somebody's new tuning in here and didn't see the Sunday show, 62 and a half, one test, two tests, and no, not a double top because not reversing a big enough move. Still tradable on a break of that though, breaking down and then that's all she wrote. And this is when everybody was buying the junk up. Everything's fine and dandy again. I remember it because I traded through it. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at this, that we could easily see markets don't exactly repeat, but they do rhyme. Agree. It, it's completely different, but you have a very similar price action. Okay, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And the, the conditions are different. We had a, we're had we actually more overvalued in some ways than uh, we were in, in uh, 2000. So that's what I'm talking about. In case you look at Lily targets to the downside, Lily targets to the downside. My targets really are back to this major. This We got out of our Lily position. I will watch for a nice pullback area in here. Actually, I need to set an alert on this. I'll just do it right now. Uh, I'm, I'm watching back, you know, rising rotation zone on the weekly basis. I think we'll dip into the rotation zone. Your aggressive play to watch for an area is the 279.58. More conservative is back down in here about 271 with the uh, weekly rising rotation zone. So I am keeping an eye on this for with a pullback play on Lily. You actually have more uneducated investors now than in 2000? I'll have to think about that. Uh, we have a, a very frothy environment in a lot of tech. Very frothy, especially still in unprofitable tech. Very frothy. So that I'm just going to wrap it up for now, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you to Sterling for the super chat. Thank you again to Genomic Stock for the super chat. And please join me tomorrow morning for the market preview. Until then, I will talk to everyone later.